you have to try things that you really want to try. Like you have to go for it. Otherwise, you know, how can you be satisfied knowing that you're not trying your best to give yourself the life that you imagine for yourself? And it's normal for people to have feelings of fear and inadequacy, but you cannot let them inhibit your actions. Hi everyone, it's Joe. You're listening to Occupational Hazards, a series of candid conversations with some of the most inspiring people I know as they share their path to finding their calling and all the gritty realities of their jobs. Whether you want to demystify your dream job or are someone like me who enjoys getting a peek into other people's work lives, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to season two of the pod. So space travel has been in the headlines a lot this year. But not enough is said about the engineers that make these space missions possible. Our next guest is a former makeup artist and model who pivoted to mechanical engineering in her late 20s and now makes robotic spacecrafts for NASA. Living proof that it's never too late to go for your dreams, she also has a powerful message for women who want to pursue careers in STEM. Michelle Easter is a mechatronics engineer in the payload and small spacecraft mechanical engineering section at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. JPL is a federally funded research and development center operated by the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the U.S. government. Currently, Michelle is leading the design of the end effector for the Mars Sample Return Project, Earth Return Orbiter, while working as a member of the Mars Perseverance Rover Strategic Surface Operations Team. She was awarded the Charles Ilachi Early Career Achievement Award for her work as the mechanical lead for the recent dual drive family of actuators facilitating simultaneous electromechanical hardware deliveries to multiple Earth science spacecrafts, including SWAT, Sentinel-6, NISAR, and Maya. Prior to joining NASA's JPL, Michelle worked in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at Princeton University, served as a robotics instructor for academically gifted, underprivileged youth in the Rutgers Future Scholars Summer Program at Rutgers University, worked as a teaching assistant at her alma mater, the Stevens Institute of Technology, and served as an engineering aide at the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory. Inspired by the impact of her STEM education on her own life, Michelle is passionate about mentoring others and supporting engineering outreach including founding the nonprofit Mind Makers, which is focused on making robotics education accessible and approachable for new learners of all ages. More recently, Michelle served as ventilator test lead on the VITAL project. The VITAL stands for Ventilator Intervention Technology Accessible Locally. This was a JPL initiative to free up the nation's limited supply of traditional ventilators so they could be used on patients with the most severe COVID-19 symptoms. She tells us all about this on the episode, impressively in layman's terms. Note on my audio situation. Our voices were joined by the crowing of our neighbor's chickens and occasionally the barking of her dog in the background. Gotta love that work from home life. Also, credit where credit is due, Michelle talks at one point in the interview about how her girlfriends acted as her ultimate cheerleaders throughout everything she went through. I would like to take this time to express my gratitude to my girls, Christelle and Shanna, for helping make this interview happen. Ladies, I would not be able to do what I do without the support of people like you. Thank you. And now here's Michelle, who's going to tell us all about her stellar journey. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I'm so excited because I am very curious 
to hear about how your pandemic arc has been going. A lot of the other professionals we've had on the pod work in careers that are more familiar to people. But, you know, when someone says NASA, it's very aspirational and shrouded in mystery. So we'd love to hear more about it. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, yeah, the pandemic has been, you know, very impactful to our workflow, of course, as it has been for everybody. Personally, I work on hardware and I work usually on robotic spacecraft. And a big part of that actually requires me to be in person, especially, you know, a lot of last year, I was actually in phases of testing where I have to show up and, you know, put the thing in the chamber to actually physically run the test and be there to push buttons, so to speak. And so even during times in the initial parts of the lockdown, I've actually been going on site and having to kind of adapt to, you know, evolving restrictions and guidelines and, um, you know, new protocols and policies. And it's been challenging for sure. It's been a blessing that I've been able to kind of retain some sense of normalcy and that I still get to physically go and show up on site. But, you know, we're also like, I think maybe like one sixth of the people are actually on lab. So it's kind of a ghost town. It's definitely strange, I'll say. And of course, working part time sometimes as well from home. Um, and, you know, definitely having the, you know, the Zoom WebEx struggle thing, but it's been a lot. I actually, in the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, a member of the Vital Ventilator Project, which was a JPL COVID-19 response. Did you hear anything about it, Joe? Or No, please tell us more. I think the COVID news, I'm based in the Philippines, so a lot of the news I'm getting is more kind of Asian region, but I'd love to hear more about your experience. So back in, I guess it was uh, March of last year, um, was really kind of when, the, you know, the pandemic was ramping up and there was the global lockdown started really everywhere. And when lockdowns first started in the States, within the very first couple days, there was a small handful of people at JPL who kind of hypothesized, like, can't we do something about this? You know, what can we do? Um, and at the time, there was a really big focus and concern about inadequate supply of ventilators uh, in the global uh, market. So a group of GPLers actually put their minds to work to think of, okay, you know, how can we increase the amount of ventilators that there are? And it started with an idea about maybe can we get Home Depot materials, you know, stuff that you can get at a local hardware store that you can throw together to make an, a ventilator in an emergency, right? So it started like that. And then, of course, as soon as we involved a medical professional, uh, Dr. Gurevich over at Huntington Hospital, who's a pulmonary expert, you know, he kind of, you know, slaps some sense into us, so to speak, by saying no doctors or hospitals are going to let anything through the door that does not have the blessing of the FDA, which is, of course, the American uh, regulatory agency. And so basically everybody reshifted okay well how do we design a ventilator that can be you know low cost put together quickly use materials that do not interfere with the existing ventilator supply chain and specifically target uh, ARDS patients ARDS is the disorder resultant from advanced COVID you know how can we do that in a way that can actually get regulatory approval is it possible and of course the spirit of our co-workers is such that we, you know, insisted on finding a way to make it happen. And in 37 days, we came up with the first design of a pneumatic ventilator that did exactly uh, kind of what I described, which is, uh, you know, provide high pressure ventilation targeted for patients that had symptoms related to ARDS. And we actually, within 37 days, got FDA EUA, which is the emergency use authorization uh, for the time of the pandemic approval, which was a crazy feat. <laughs> I don't amazing. Think NASA can do anything in 37 days. <laughs> yeah, That's and, and uh, it was amazing. And then like in one month later, we actually popped out another design, which was based on a compressor motor. So there was two different pressure sources uh, and both of them, we got the regulatory approval. Oh, that's amazing. You know, I wish the news would focus more on things like this because we do get, I mean, there was a steady stream of CNN when the pandemic was unfolding, but a lot of the news that was being reported coming out of the States, at least, because they show blips from different countries, was more about the, I guess, the 
personalities that were like disagreeing <laughs> over certain regulations. I wish that people had focused a bit more on what people were doing to help because it sounds like there was a lot of innovation happening behind the scenes too. And I really hats off to you and your team for focusing your efforts on something that could help the broader population. That's amazing. Thank you. You know, yeah, there was, you know, a lot of controversy obviously going on last spring, of course, especially coming out of the States. And uh, yeah, there was a, a lot of confusion about the virus um, in the initial stages as well. So it was definitely a very complicated time. NASA actually uh, generated a couple other amazing COVID-related technologies. It wasn't even just JPL. And even there was two other groups at JPL that came up with designs for 3D printable respirators and then also uh, wearable electronics that you can wear around your neck that would basically alert you if they noticed that you were going to touch your face. And, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, one really beautiful and inspiring thing that came out of the pandemic as awful and dark as it's been, is the world became in it together. And it, you know, really became a global community of people thinking outside of themselves and bigger. And, you know, what can I do to team up with others and use my brain power or whatever resources I have to try to help and fight this. And that was really inspiring. It's like the spirit of science and tech, right? Problem solving, which... Yeah. yeah. And that's like, I think one of the beautiful magical things actually about science and tech is that it can be used to improve the world for humans. <laughs> you know, it's like so great. You know, even the ventilators, the two different designs that we uh, had approval for, Caltech, which uh, manages JPL, uh, they actually took the designs and made them available for free through free licensing opportunities to device manufacturers all over the world. And we currently have, I forget the exact number, maybe it's 25 or so, uh, licensees uh, all over the world that are working on building up ventilators to distribute locally. You know, we have a manufacturer in Brazil. We've got, I think, a Taiwanese. Gosh, we've got so many licensees. Uh, we've got a couple in India, uh, bless them, which are in the final throes of getting regulatory approval. And it's amazing that you can take, you know, a team of people of a fixed size and they can team up and, and, you know, use their knowledge of STEM and technology to create something that can be given to help people all over the world. It's, uh, yes, using your brain for powerful good, you know? <laughs> yeah. And while this was all happening, were you also working on the Perseverance rover that, you know, the mission to Mars? So I started working on the rover mission actually last summer, which is kind of strange because it's, of course, after the rover was uh, totally built and, you know, en route to Mars. And that is because I got involved in doing ground-based testing to help validate operation scheme for the sampling system on the surface of Mars. And so I guess that's the long way of saying, yes, we're all always multitasking, so while a lot of our traditional flight work, like the rover work and um, other uh, Earth observing satellite work that I worked on in the past year, kind of went on pause as we like focused super intensely on creating the ventilator design packages. And then once those were created, we were able to shift back into kind of parallel processing and, and pick up the reins, so to speak, with the flight deliveries, including yeah, the rover uh, testing work that I've worked on and, and some other stuff. Okay, that's amazing, because that's actually how you came into my consciousness. <laughs> like, we have a common friend who was congratulating you on being part of the, the mission to Mars. And when I was reading your bio, I was so fascinated by just your whole journey. Do you think you can tell us how you discovered the sciences? I alluded to it a little bit in your bio, but I'd be really interested to hear kind of your brief description of how you got to where you are. Yeah, so I definitely was always into science. I think like even when I was little, I grew up on a farm and I was always an explorer. I was always, you know, barefooted climbing trees, catching tadpoles in the creek out back and, um, you know, collecting different leaves and making sure I could identify the names of the different trees they came from. I was always like very exploratory in nature. And as I kind of like turned into a teenager, I definitely got away from really pursuing science of any sort. I got super into uh, makeup and fashion and also into linguistics. And in high school, I totally studied Spanish. I took like six years of Spanish crammed into three years. And 
just discovered this whole other side of my interests in writing literary analysis and poetry and stuff. And I kind of honestly wanted to stray from STEM for years. And even after graduating high school, uh, I did not go to college. If I would have gone to college at the time, I would have studied international communications or something like that and tried to learn as many languages as I could because I was super into communication. And I didn't do that for a number of reasons and instead actually decided to become a licensed makeup artist. And then that ended up leading me into becoming a fashion model. And I spent several years just working as a fashion model, especially once I realized I could travel that definitely appealed to like my adventures and exploratory side. So I took advantage of that feature of the work uh, in that you can, you know, go to some country and work the market there for a few months and then move on. And honestly, I did that for a long time. I had no idea I was going to go to college or be interested in STEM or anything. And I finally moved to New York one day to work the market and I decided to try college and I did one semester as a part-time student and I took like Spanish and linguistic related classes and I loved it. And that kind of made me realize like, hey, you know what, traveling is fun, fashion and makeup is amazing and creative. However, you're actually an intellectual (laughs) and I realized that I like the structure of school and stuff. And then that summer though, I decided to build this doghouse. And it was for my little dog that I just gotten. He was like seven pounds, fluffy little thing. And, you know, I'm a farm girl. I still had all my woodworking tools. I had an airbrush, a little compressor and an airbrush kit that I had from doing makeup. And I basically put all of those skills together and I designed this dog house for my dog. And I designed it like I measured his little body. You know, I sketched it all out. I had these boards, you know, I wanted it to look like his face. So I had to like you know, make the doorway a certain dimension so that it would fit his little body perfectly. And I cut out all the little wood pieces and like, you know, assembled everything together and got all stoked about it. And I airbrushed the whole thing, right? And then it turned like next level when I was like, you know what, it's New York, it's super hot, it's muggy. My dog has a lot of fur. I wanna put ventilation in this dog house to keep my dog super cool. Cause honestly, I was super understimulated and I just needed an activity to keep myself occupied because I was just modeling. <laughs> So I started kind of like poking around online and I found like, hey, look at these little computer fans that you put in desktops. Like, what if I put that in the roof of this thing? That'd be fun. Well, how would I power that? So then I start looking like, how do you power a little fan? And then I like start stumbling across components and, you know, batteries and stuff. And then I found, hey, on eBay, you can find solar panel cells that maybe they have chips or cracks, so they'll have a reduced efficiency, but they still function and will deliver some power. Well, that's fun. Then I started thinking, what if I put solar cells on the roof? So he has his own little solar fan system. So then I started looking, how do I do the calculation given a reduced efficiency? How much surface area of these solar panels do I need? I love it. And like, yeah, you get where I'm going. It's like rabbit hole central. And spoiler, basically the solar was so inefficient at that time and the added inefficiency made it so bad that I realized from my calculations, I would have had to build like multiple awnings for the dog just to get the solar power up. Okay, no, <laughs> this is really ridiculous. I <laughs> scrapped the whole fan idea and I ended up just going with a passive ventilation design that uh, had strategically placed vents in the ceiling. And I put little screens in to keep the bugs out and stuff. But the whole thing was a learning process for me. And it was basically like, me having fun exploring my ability to learn and my ability to create what I imagined. And it was super empowering for me. And even the fact that I was able to figure out how to, you know, see how much surface area of solar cells I needed, give it a reduced efficiency. Hey, I was like, I had an epiphany where I was like, I did all this on my own. Nobody helped me. I'm doing it for fun. And I have no education, like no higher education. And it shocked me. And I was kind of like, I wonder like what I could be capable of if I actually got a technical education, you know? And literally the next semester I was like, okay, well, let me try taking some STEM stuff. And I signed up for physics 101, which was physics concepts without math, just concepts and like super introductory, like pre-college level basically. 
um, but I had never taken physics. And I took like a intro to computer science class and mm -hmm. I took pre-calculus. And I loved every class and I just, honestly, I crushed them. I had to get a tutor for the math to help me because I had been out for so long, but I did super well at all of the classes. And it was like, so shocking to me, you know, even though fine, when I was a little kid, I liked science, but so what, here I am, you know, in my, you know, mid to late twenties trying to take STEM and I didn't know that I'd be able to do it. But what I discovered by trying is that I, I excelled <laughs> in the STEM fields and, um, it just opened up this whole new area of possibility for my future that I never imagined. Uh, you know, I never imagined that I would ever work for NASA, you know, it, it, and especially, you know, when I think about how I started pursuing STEM, it, it all started with such a low expectation. It was like, I wonder what I might be able to do. Like, I wonder if maybe I might be able to try these classes, you know, and with that one first step, I discovered like, oh, yeah, I can do this. And actually, it makes me feel great to be able to do this. I want to do more. And I just kept following that uh, that path. And, you know, it just, it introduced me to mentors who were critical in supporting me. You know, they saw that I was trying really hard and I was passionate and I was excited about it. And of course, mentors are critical for anybody's success. Yeah, and long story short, it snowballed and, and uh, got me into in the position that I'm at now. And uh, I, have a, yeah, I have a bachelor's of engineering in mechanical engineering. Um, and I did a concentration in robotics, and now I build uh, robotics spacecraft components for uh, space missions. That's amazing. I have a question because your bio is probably quite different from the people you work with. How did they react? I mean, did it matter? Did they ask, like, you know, what did you do before? Because I'm just imagining the process of applying for just jobs, internships, all of these things. Mm. Normally, they look at your resume, right? So before mm. you landed your first job in the science field, how did you go about looking for careers? And then how was your previous experience met in the workplace? That's a really good question. And my answer actually changes depending on where I was in the phase of my transition into this new career. Of course, like at first, when I was first trying to apply to get into colleges, you know, I was an older student. And, uh, you know, I had all this gap year and I was competing with these extremely intelligent, you know, prodigy kids who grew up with technology, who I was 10 years older than, and I was received less well. It was definitely challenging. And, you know, again, it was like during those initial times, for me, it, it was all about my mentor at the time was Professor Godfrey Gums, uh, this amazing, my first physics professor, actually, uh, the one that taught the Physics 101 class. He helped teach me how to do all of these things, like how to try to apply for an internship, um, how to sign up for classes. And he, as an individual, was really fundamental in, in uh, helping support me through that process um, and, and, you know, encouraging me to keep trying even when, you know, different people would react differently to me just because, you know, I had this different kind of background and they, you know, everybody has unconscious or conscious biases that you know, influence how they uh, respond to people, of course. But fast forward now at JPL, honestly, when I applied at JPL, uh, by the time that I, you know, was in a position to apply, you know, I had a great GPA. I had actually done a couple internships, you know, and I had done well with them. And I, uh, they had resulted uh, in a, a several physics publications for me as an undergraduate, which is extremely unusual. And so I had actually kind of built up this resume and then it became like a bonus feature of me instead of like this unusual background. It's like, okay, yeah, you know, Michelle took this break. She's, you know, was interested in linguistics and then traveled the world as a fashion model um, and then went back to school and did all this stuff. And it became like, you know, an extra, I guess, a thing of interest. Like, I definitely feel like, you know, my management at work uh, really likes the fact that I have a different background because you know, it influences me to have certain personality traits that are beneficial. You know, it increases, you know, my confidence and my willingness to take risks and try new things and to, um, you know, try to take a leadership role and, and other uh, different characteristics that I developed from, you know, being confident to travel during a time when there was no smartphones, I'll note. <laughs> and so, so it definitely depends, you know, once you, I'll say that, like, you know, once you get some street cred <laughs> under your belt, um, then you know, you being different becomes like a bonus. In the beginning, it, it is hard. It is critical to 
find mentors to support you and to help uh, get you opportunities where you're able to prove yourself because in the beginning getting those opportunities they're super competitive you know you're competing with a global marketplace of genius prodigy kids and so a comment to mentors adopt an older person who's trying to change their life you know and and then help mentor them and note to people who want to pursue stem try it and get a mentor and you know if i get a mentor it's show up sit in the front raise your hand have a good attitude offer to help you know ask what you can do will you be willing to give me a project i want to learn more you know be that proactive person in the beginning rack up your street cred and then your unconventional background becomes i think like added bonus yeah speaking of that unconventional background were there any aspects of your background in linguistics doing makeup traveling as a model or even modeling that actually help you in your day to day that or that give you a different perspective by which you can problem solve yeah definitely um i mean communications and international travel experience to me it's like it's pretty clear um i can you know if i'm if i'm interacting with somebody and i'm trying to communicate with them and they're not understanding the words that i'm using then i can you know okay i need to select a new set of words try to communicate this from a different perspective and it's all about trying to understand who am i talking to and how do they understand and communication is critical for engineering you can't build anything complicated if you don't have extremely clear communication and understanding between people you know and and big groups of people all kinds of different people from different backgrounds that may be in you know different states or countries or whatever um as you collaborate to build you know large spacecraft for example and so it's funny cuz it seems when you think about it that way it's like oh of course it's obvious it makes sense if you have a background in communication then you would actually make an excellent engineer because you're like really good at communicating in different ways and clearly the new skill set is just you have to add the stem skills and then of course you have your bonus skills and then as far as like the makeup artistry and like the modeling stuff assembly of a spacecraft or you know of any components is very much a production and so planning all of those elements and having the different individuals there the technicians the quality assurance people having the procedures written out going through the motions making sure you have all the supplies like getting the setup all ready before you start your steps all of those things are super similar to any kind of production and uh in that regard you know any background that you have in working in a big team to create something is of course going to be beneficial in making you a dynamic team player in creating a more complicated thing like a spacecraft or some other piece of technology yeah that's that's a really interesting way of putting it because it is a production like you said and i love how your background actually became a point of strength for you i think uh, I, i saw this quote somewhere that said when we're younger we tend to shy away from that which makes us different and then as we get older and grow into our own as we embrace that that's actually what allows us to succeed like embracing all these different facets that make us who we are and that's our point of differentiation and i think you are a perfect example of this thank you honestly like that couldn't be more true and like when i think back about you know what was in my mind when i was a teenager and i was you know making the choice to i want to be interested in this now and when i think back about it honestly I'm 5 foot 9. I've been this tall since I was like 12 years old. And so I, you know, was this tall, super skinny girl, and I remember one of the biggest things that changed my experience in high school was when I entered high school, I decided I want to play volleyball because I want to be around other tall girls. You know? And it's like super simple and it's super fundamental like everybody wants to be around people that they can identify with, like physically, you know? but mm-hmm. the path that that kind of led me down was you know away from stem and now as i've gotten older you know i you know fully embraced my femininity um you know i worked as a makeup artist i worked in fashion i mean that's pretty feminine industries you know and i fully have like encapsulated those elements into my identity right but i've also at this point had the strength to make it all the way through engineering school wearing my makeup and wearing my skirts and being feminine despite the fact that it's an extremely male dominated environment you know a lot of women that actually work in stem and especially engineering disciplines um that are more male dominated specifically like uh, mechanical 
uh, will tend to dress more masculine to try to assimilate. And, you know, that was super challenging for me because it made me question my identity. Do I belong? And as an adult, of course, going back, I had way more personal strength and lack of concern for, I guess, other people's judgments about me. And it, it definitely empowered me more to maintain those feminine elements in my identity while pursuing the STEM path, which ultimately has kind of, as you said, allowed me to fully embrace my full identity, which is, yes, I may be super feminine, but I'm, yes, also super into STEM and, and an extremely capable engineer. And yeah, and now that I'm older, I'm like, okay, I get it. I have to actually embrace all this stuff for myself to be happy and to be the best version of myself that I can be. And yes, I so agree with everything you said. Like, yes, that's actually been like the theme of my past year is like really embracing that and try to like echo that uh, out to other young women too, because I know that there's tons of other young women who are definitely like me, super capable in STEM, super feminine, um, and maybe just not confident to embrace those things, but you've got to. <laughs> yeah, the difference is that those girls will have people like you as a role model where maybe you didn't have that growing up. So yeah, you're the mentor you wanted to be as well. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, because we talk about, you know, feminine industries, which is, I guess, quote unquote, like the more tradi historically, traditionally considered as feminine industries would be like, you know, more related to the arts and like makeup, fashion. When we talk about science, it's usually considered a more, quote unquote, male dominated industry. And there have been several, I think, educators that came under fire for actually saying, well, maybe the reason girls aren't going into STEM is because they don't have the aptitude for it. So they tried to make it more of a nature versus a nurture conversation, which I feel personally is problematic. Do you think you could talk about what ways society and maybe even the people in the field can actually encourage more women or young women to embrace that side of them and enter this field? Yeah, um, you know, I find it funny when people make comments, of course, that make statements about women not being capable of doing something like pursuing science because of their gender. And, you know, I find it funny because I'm like, hey, I'm actually really good at this and I'm definitely a girl, you know. So I just think it's ridiculous. But what I do know is that, you know, when people say things like that, and especially um, they say it in front of other people, they say it in front of children, they say it in front of little boys, that perpetuates uh, stereotypes and biases. And those things, you know, flow down to society and those messages get ingrained in people's heads. And that is what fundamentally, you know, drives young women out of the STEM field is because they are constantly being bombarded with messages being told that they don't belong by people making comments like that. And like, that is what makes it hard to stay. Not because women are not capable of doing the technical content. I mean, there's plenty of examples going back decades and decades and decades of women excelling in the STEM field. So it's just not technically correct. And it's just definitely the case that, you know, when people get into their heads, women are not supposed to do this. And then, you know, little boys are telling their little girl classmates, like, you're a girl, you're not supposed to do that. Those things add up and that alienates young women from pursuing STEM. So anyways, that needs to stop. Mm hmm I was going to ask, what happens once the women get to the workplace? What are the barriers that you've encountered that result in women dropping out from the field? Because you talk about the yeah. attrition, yeah, more in the preteen, because I asked about young women. What about like later stage in their career? Yeah, it, it just evolves, but it's basically just a continuation of the same thing. I mean, you know, I think all young women, um, you know, all women, uh, screw age, <laughs> all women have, you know, their stories. I, I like to say you have your bucket of stories, just throw the story in the bucket, keep trucking along, you know, eventually you get a wagon to carry all your buckets around. Um, but, you know, I mean, I know, like, as I went through engineering school, you know, even being one of the only women in the classroom, you know, boys may make comments to you. I had a male group, you know, team up and think it was funny because they were all boys in the group to, they thought it'd be funny to tell me that I should be the secretary uh, because I'm the girl. I'm like, I have the highest GPA out of everybody in the group. So probably I shouldn't be the secretary. You know, it's like, it's funny, but like that kind of like death by a thousand cuts thing that you have to put up with. You know, I even had a teacher in college picking on me in front of a bunch of other students, like for his own personal entertainment. And he even said like that he was having fun picking on me. And, and I, you know, I had to, you know, you always have to stand up and you have to uh, speak out against that when it happens. 
if it happens to you, if it happens to somebody else, if you're a boy, if you're a girl, if you're a man, a woman, I don't care if you don't even know what you identify with, you have to speak out when you see people that are trying to bully somebody for being another, you know? And yeah, that, you know, it, it definitely happens. And it's, it's little comments, I think, mostly that make, you know, young women feel like over time they don't belong uh, and question themselves. And that sucks, you know, and that really shouldn't happen. Yeah, I guess conversely, looking on the positive side, has NASA or other places you've worked, because you've done a number of things, like at Princeton, I think you were a contractor mm -hmm. as well, and then you were a, a robotics instructor at Rutgers, but all those workplace environments, uh, mostly in the STEM field, were there policies that those institutions had that actually encouraged women or that were supportive of women um, across different phases of their life? You know, a lot of people talk about what happens when some women choose to become mothers and that can be a barrier to further advancing their career. Do you think you can talk about things that you saw like at NASA or in the academe that were actually supportive of women, policies that were supportive of women? Yeah, you know, I'll say that my experience personally at JPL, I feel very grateful that I feel very supported by my management, multiple levels of management up. I've noticed, especially like increasing a lot more in the past year or so, a very actively changing culture that's, you know, trying to really make people aware of the different environments and circumstances that women, you know, may have to kind of deal with as part of their day to day. And one of the, my favorite things actually at JPL that started in the past year is they've started doing what they call listening sessions. And listening sessions, it's basically, you know, for one hour, there's, you know, moderators, and I've actually volunteered to be a moderator for my section listening sessions. And the goal is like basically free train of thought. Like people are encouraged to talk about whatever's on their mind, like, you know, whatever, how the conversation goes, like without judgment, so that people start actually really understanding each other more. And, you know, in my section, there's, I wish I knew the number exactly, maybe there's 15 to 20% women, which is not a big amount. And we've had a lot of growth, I've felt personally in, you know, how we've been supported by our management even more actively after we've started like speaking and listening sessions, for example. And, you know, of course we get the traditional stuff like maternity leave and whatnot, but there's a cultural thing at, you know, I'll say at JPL and I assume at NASA, but you know, I've only worked at JPL, but it's of course a um, Caltech managed facility that produces work for NASA. So in, in that regard, we're a, a NASA center is that people are really valued as these extreme technical experts there's a woman, uh, Rebecca Mikuloff, who's line management in my section. She, of course, is a woman and she has a couple kids. And, you know, she showed us this picture uh, recently. There was a handful of us young women who were talking to her about, um, you know, how do we manage delivering hardware in a competitive, highly technical environment like JPL with trying to have a baby? You know, what am I supposed to be in this like bunny suit in the clean room? which is super hot and uncomfortable with a pregnancy belly. Do they have pregnancy versions of these bunny suits? You know, I mean, is this a job that actually allows women to, you know, go through this process and actually do their job? And of course she, you know, threw up a photo on the screen for us to see of her pregnant in a bunny suit. <laughs> and it was funny, you know, I kind of had to stop and chuckle um, and kind of ground myself in seeing that it's like, you know, they train us to be these technical experts and they want us to stay. They want us to stay at JPL. And so, you know, they recognize, obviously, people are going to have families. And if you have women, the women are the ones, obviously, that, you know, have to carry the baby. And yeah, it's, it's funny because there aren't, you know, a whole bunch of very obvious, clear policies that are super in my face that tell me that I'll be protected. But the culture is such that, you know, I know that I'm valued and I know that I'm supported. And I know that, you know, even if I decide that I want to have a baby, my management is going to want me back producing work on site. And that kind of feels good. Yeah, that's so important. In addition to having these strong mentors all around you, you've actually also become a mentor. Do you think you can tell me a bit more about the work you do outreach with schools, middle school and high school kids to kind of encourage them to go down this path you did? Yeah, I was so profoundly impacted by my mentor in college. And I have a mentor now at JPL who also has made a profound impact on my life. And, you know, I think mentors 
can totally change the world for people. And, you know, anybody who has a little bit of extra bandwidth just to adopt one mentee and give them, you know, 30 minutes each week, uh, you can make a huge impact in somebody's life. I definitely have done a bunch of mentoring. I mentor a handful of people right now. In particular, I have a soft spot for young women uh, just because I understand the plight. <laughs> and I've done a ton of uh, outreach work. I've developed a couple of educational programs in college. I developed a middle school program. I also developed a pre-college preparatory program for Rutgers, as you mentioned. I started a nonprofit, which is called Mind Makers. And we're in the process of developing open source educational content to introduce people from non-technical backgrounds to robotics type content. And that's been really rewarding. I also uh, love to do public talks uh, anytime I can. I work very closely with a first robotics uh, tech competition uh, team. It's actually two teams that are Girl Scout robotics teams over in Pasadena. I've spent several years mentoring the students that are the engineering class at Arcadia High School, which is a local high school by where JPL is. And I love it. Uh, <laughs> I love it so much. One of the best things about working at NASA is getting to share NASA with other people because it's so exciting. And it's uh, the things that we do are just, you know, so exciting and impactful and really loved by people around the world. So it's, it's inspiring and energizing to be able to share that. And then, of course, personally, I was really so shocked by how much my life changed uh, and how much power I took back for my future just from getting a STEM education. And so because of that, I'm definitely very motivated to, you know, both try to turn people on to STEM and, you know, help them to unlock that hidden capability that maybe they never knew they had. And really everybody should just try to take some classes just because gosh, if you discover that you're good at STEM and that you love it and you never even knew, you know, it can totally change your life. Yeah. And then I, I guess like more recently, I've definitely been focusing on trying to spend time supporting other women that I work with at JPL, just because, you know, we have to support each other to make sure that we retain all of the bright new young women that we bring in. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, when you were talking about uh, how you've organized programs and done a lot of talks, I think that in particular is so important. I saw this engineering ceremony. Um, I knew somebody was graduating from an engineering program at BU, actually, Boston University. And the dean of their engineering school, I believe he was also in charge of the engineering program across either grade school, middle school, or the high school districts. Anyway, he was shaping the STEM curriculum. And he was talking about how the education at the grade school levels or primary school levels needs to be upgraded to include engineering and applied sciences. So that was uh, something he talked about. He's, you know, he was talking about like, we spend so much time learning about icebergs, which is really important and great, but, you know, versus learning to operate a car or like a bike or whatever. He's like, you know, how much time of your life are you going to spend on an iceberg versus a car? They're just like very everyday things that we could appreciate more and might spark an interest if we got kids involved a bit earlier. So that was one point he made. But the other point he made, which kind of connects to something you said that I really liked, was he said, you know, people can't be what they can't see. And if you want to push people into these fields, the other industries also, or engineering professionals and science professionals need to maybe work with other fields so that we get creative representation as well. He talked about how when CSI first launched, there was a spike in applications for like forensics and criminal science, right? And when I think there was a time Boston Legal and The Practice and Ally McBeal were the big shows, then everyone started applying to law school. Like the culture very much shaped people's interests and imagined possibilities for themselves. So he said, okay, so we have CSI, we have, you know, lawyers. Who is the most famous engineer on TV today? This was pre-Big Bang Theory, pre-Chuck. After he gave that speech, there were a lot of other representations and culture of like engineers and whatnot. But at the time he gave his speech, he asked, like, who's the most famous engineer? And it nobody could answer. And the answer was Homer Simpson. He was a nuclear engineer at that time. Which oh, is a terror. Oh my yeah. gosh, it's hilarious. <laughs> which is like not the oh, best well, representation, exactly. right? Of what an engineer does. <laughs> so as a result, he was saying most people don't even know. Like, unless you had an engineer in the family or like 
you know, right. like a mentor in school who kind of told you what this profession was. Like as a kid, Super most kids will, yeah, will not know what it is exactly. So I think the work you're doing in like saying, hi, I'm Michelle, you know, I'm an engineer. This is what I do. And if you like look like me or are like me, or maybe you have a different background, like you can still do this. That's so powerful. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I appreciate that. And, you know, I definitely didn't know what an engineer was when I was growing up. I had no clue. You know, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, and I had to kind of discover it. Oh, as an adult, I like to build things and figure out how to design them based on trying to understand science. Oh, that's engineering. Oh, cool. And I totally agree that uh, kids at a young age should get introduced to engineering because this is the new normal. You know, engineering is you know, the, 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 the fun element that I like, especially in the context of what I do, is we get to take the wild technical imaginations of the scientists and bring them to life, you know? And the scientists are thinking like, oh, I want to study this. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. And, you know, engineers, come up with a thing that does that. And we're like, oh, crap, we got to scratch our heads and figure it out and, you know, team up and strategize and do all this work and figure it out. And it's a challenge. And it's so fun. And, you know, technology is booming. There's, you know, software in everything we do. There's autonomous systems everywhere around us. There's robotics everywhere around us. And that's only going to increase. And so, you know, engineering is, my gosh, it's just so much job potential and practical application, which kids get, you know, if you talk to them about math, how many kids are like, okay, well, when am I ever going to use this? What am I going to do with this? The engineering is the, what are you going to do with this? And the answer is, literally anything you want. It's very empowering. And when you start teaching kids how to put things together and how to problem solve at young ages uh, in the context of learning engineering, it builds their confidence. It's empowering. It teaches them critical problem solving capabilities. And of course, it also introduces them to this potential career path that, you know, is going to have tons of job security and, you know, benefits and salaries and all kinds of goodness and you know, positive things for their future. But uh, yeah, I, I just think it's the, it's the language of the future. And I definitely uh, resonate with the statements about getting kids that exposure early on. It, it couldn't benefit them more. Yeah. And I mean, benefits that you've mentioned aside, there's also like the bigger impact on society, right? They're literally solving problems that save lives, <laughs> that push the bounds of kind of how to improve the way we live. And also help us discover things about ourselves. Like I think the space exploration missions, uh, as we discover new planets, we, we learn more about ourselves and our planet as well. So all of that is super uh, important. I wanted to talk about something that you touched on er briefly earlier, but I guess I wanted to ask, what would you do differently if you could go back in time? Would you do anything differently? For instance, you said, you know, at that time you decided not to go to college for a variety of reasons, but if you could, would you, would you do that? I think that I was reading another interview that you did where you said it doesn't get talked about enough that maybe going to college after high school may not be the right path for everybody because not everyone's ready to go at that time and get the most that they can out of it at that age. Yeah, I believe that really strongly. Um, it's especially in the States and I'm sure in other countries, um, I'm just most familiar with the States. There's like a huge cultural push, like you have to go to college after high school. And if you don't, you're like the failure kid on the block. You know, it's like, well, you know, Bobby down the street's going to college. And so is, you know, Joe down the street on the other block. Like, what's wrong with you? You're the only one not. And it's so not right. I mean, you know, most 18 year olds, they've never lived outside their parents' house. They haven't really explored and experimented different things that they've imagined. And there's a lot of kids who turn 18 and they are prodigies and they are just on the track and good for them. But that's definitely not everybody. And for people that are not necessarily ready for school or they don't necessarily know what they wanna do, it can be really detrimental to just, you know, throw yourself into a program because you think you're supposed to and then not do well or struggle and incur debt. It's going to be damaging to your self-esteem and you have debt and you waste time of your young years. And uh, it's funny you brought that up because actually one of the catalysts for uh, me that encouraged me to go to school was I actually read this book called Real Education by Charles Murray. 
And the book is actually about just that topic, how, uh, you know, it's kind of a, an opinion piece, but he provides a whole bunch of examples about how people that may be uh, really great going into a trade school and then starting their own business, uh, maybe they start their own repair shop, for example, where they can, you know, run their own business and make a good amount of money and do something they love that's rewarding, but not have to go to college. You know, there's, there's lots of options, you know, and different paths people can take. And he really focused on how it, you know, really can be damaging to people to just force themselves to take some path because their parents are telling them to, or society is telling them to, or whatever. And it was funny because I read all this and I was, of course, working as a full-time model at the time. And what it reminded me was of my childhood when I used to love school. And that epiphany kind of was one of the, the first things that actually made me sign up for that first semester of those linguistics classes. Because I remembered I used to actually get like a really good feeling about myself, you know, positive self-confidence boost from performing well in school. It's a really simple thing. And me just kind of re-remembering that really kind of like re-engaged me and thinking like, oh, maybe I should try that. But the key element there for me was that I had tried all kinds of other things that I wanted to try. I had become a licensed makeup artist. Um, you know, I did special effects uh, movie makeup for some independent movies, which was really fun. Um, I traveled the world uh, working as a model. I moved to New York. I did all these things that I wanted to do and, you know, kind of got it out of my system such that when I had that epiphany, I was like, well, let me try this. And I definitely don't think I would have performed the same way if I, you know, if everything else about my life was the same and I was just had gone into engineering school at 18, given all of the other variables in my life at the time, there is absolutely no way that I would have had the same result because I just wasn't in the mindset then. And instead, when I finally, I, I, you know, I started college, I worked part-time non-degree student for several semesters. And when I finally transferred into engineering school, I was like 29 or something. And I was so ready for it. And that's all I wanted to do. And I was hyper-focused and I wasn't worried about partying. You know, I did all the stuff I wanted to do. And I really think that, you know, taking that personal journey and trying what I wanted to try and having my own personal self-discovery process was totally required for me to really just excel in the way that I did definitely would not have been the same if I did it a different way. <laughs> yeah. If you don't mind my asking, what was the reaction from your support group or your immediate maybe family and friends as you were going on this journey? In what ways did they provide support? My girlfriends were like my biggest cheerleaders. Oh my gosh. Like my one girlfriend called me like the one that got away because I was like one of the first to leave the modeling industry. <laughs> and like, I love that they cheered me on. They bragged about me. They, you know, would... Gosh, I, when I locked myself in my apartment for finals studying, they would come show up at my door and be like, I know you want coffee. Open the door. I brought you a coffee and come in and, and pull me away from my desk and sit me down and, and cheer me on. And, you know, gosh, man, they they really encouraged me and helped me to feel like I had a part of my you know normal identity still with me like, so that I wasn't you know, feeling like I was sacrificing myself to immerse myself in this totally alternate universe that was like foreign to me. And so in that regard, honestly, my girlfriends were critical to me getting through that, that really challenging process of, you know, all of that <laughs> college and career change. And my sister and my mom uh, were super supportive. My, my dad, I think, uh, didn't quite uh, know what to think. Honestly, uh, he told me years later that when I first told him I wanted to try engineering school, that he, he really didn't take me seriously. And I mean, I get it. You know, I spent almost a decade running around doing something that looks like fun, you know. But, you know, ultimately, I had a, a very good uh, support system in that regard. And again, getting the mentor early on was super critical. Um, yeah, so I definitely feel grateful for that. And yeah, again, I always say my girlfriends kept me feeling normal through the whole process. They are my cheer squad. <laughs> oh, so important. I, I love that you have that very strong female support group. Michelle talks on this episode about how her girlfriends cheered her on and brought her coffee and care packages to help her study. You know what goes great with coffee and makes for a great care package? Bagels. My favorite bagels in Manila are made by Next Door Neighbor Bakery, a bakery born during the quarantine. They make everything fresh on the day of delivery. Their fresh hand-rolled bagels come in two sizes, regular 
and bite-sized. Aside from that, they have scones, croissants, gougères, as well as other breads and balaman that spreads for all the sandwiches that your heart desires. Check them out on Facebook and Instagram at Next Door Neighbor Bakery. That's neighbor spelled the American way, so B O R. And you can find their list of products and cute drawings to boot. And now back to our episode. Okay, so if you could go back in time, you'd probably do everything the same because it led you to where you are. Uh, what would be the best advice you ever received that you'd like to pass on to somebody who may be? facing the same questions that you did at that time about, you know, what field to pursue or whether this was the right path for them or whether to, you know, pursue a totally different path that would eventually lead to where you are. Any advice you'd like to give people? Yeah, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever given me this advice directly, but like, I guess like the one biggest thing is like, you have to try things that you really want to try like you have to go for it otherwise you know how can you go to sleep with yourself at the end of the day and be satisfied knowing that you're not trying your best to give yourself the life that you imagine for yourself you have to go for it and it's normal for people to have feelings of fear and inadequacy in any kind of big goal that you pursue no matter what it is be it stem or anything and that's okay. And that's normal to have emotional responses because we're not robots, but you cannot react to those feelings in that you cannot let them inhibit your actions. So, you know, yeah, basically you've got to go for what, you know, for anything that you really want to try, be it, I really wish that I want to be an engineer. I don't think I can do it. Well, you have to try for yourself. You have to try. And honestly, most likely you're going to discover that you have way more capability than you had any idea, assuming, you know, as long as you do not hold yourself back. Yeah, you got to go for it. You will discover amazing things that you're capable of that you never expected. I love that. So I, I normally ask this at the beginning, but I guess I was so absorbed by your story about the ventilators. But uh, do you think you could tell us slightly more about what your day-to-day -day might have looked like, especially pre-pandemic, and then what's your favorite part about what you do, and then maybe your not-so-favorite part? Yeah. Um, so pre-pandemic, day-to-day, um, man, I'm like, I'm running around lab. I have a really active job. I work with hardware. Um, and so depending on the phase of the project, that could mean different things. Maybe I'm, you know, sitting at my computer doing some design work or running across lab to another building in a conference room and having, you know, meetings with uh, other team members and whiteboard sessions, perhaps. Um, so there's definitely a lot of, you know, meeting with other people and then chewing on technical details to myself at my computer. And then because I work hardware, I have the very hands-on element of my job is my favorite. I get to oversee assembly of, uh, I work mostly with actuators and mechanisms. As a mechatronics engineer, specifically, I work on mechanisms that are provided power from devices to move using usually motors or electronics or things like that. And so I actually spent a lot of time uh, in clean rooms working with super extremely skilled technicians that do, you know, precision assembly of basically actuators and mechanisms that I work on. So that's an always like a very active job. I'm in a bunny suit, you know, pointing at things, bring this here. Okay, sign this step. Here's this polymer that we need. Here's the screws. Let's put these things together, which is just super fun. And then uh, I do a lot of testing work also. So testing can be very active for space. We do all kinds of crazy testing. Uh, environmental testing is fun. We do vibration testing which is where, you know, maybe you'll strap your mechanism onto this big shaker table and the table shakes the crap out of it to try to simulate the rocket launch and you make sure that it doesn't break. We have thermal tests where we, you know, bring the hardware to different temperatures and make sure that it still can operate at, you know, extremely cold or extremely hot temperatures. And all that stuff is, you know, extremely active and fun. So every day is different depending on uh, where in the project you are and where with each uh, unique little individual piece of hardware it is in its own flow. So your favorite parts of the tinkering or the hands-on work with the hardware? Would that be right? Oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> okay. What about your least favorite part or maybe 
something that is okay with you, but somebody who is unsure about this might get turned off by? Uh, probably the paperwork. We definitely have a lot of uh, red tape and paperwork. And there's other uh, industries which may have less of that. We, of course, are a publicly funded entity. And um, as a result, we are super accountable. We are not allowed to make mistakes. We are not allowed to take unnecessary risk. And all of those conservative conservatism's things that are conservative, I'll say that, <laughs> uh, stack up to mean that you have to go through like a lot of approvals and reviews and processes and everything gets documented. Everything gets documented. Like you weigh every single individual screw before you install it to record exactly how much it weighs. And for every little, literally every screw, every part that you install into your mechanism, you have to show what we call traceability, which means that you can identify the whole life history of this metal all the way to the point where it was pulled out of the earth. And you better have that paperwork trail and attach it all to your build records to get approval to send that thing to space. So that, wow. that element is like super tedious, but that's part of why we have good success rates because we do that stuff. So it's kind of a necessary evil, you know? Yeah. So related to that, the podcast is called Occupational Hazards. So I had a boss that used to scare off job applicants by telling them all the realities of the job so that they'd at least go into it with their eyes wide open. And his thinking was if you were scared off by you know, the hazards he mentioned, and you weren't maybe the right applicant for the job. So if you had to fill in this blank, you know, don't take this job if you blank, how would you fill that blank in? Maybe don't take this job if you don't like paying attention to details. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that. That's so, I mean, I'm still wrapping my head around your whole journey. That's been really, this has been really enlightening and I'm so inspired right now. But I was going to move quickly to the lightning round, just to, just on a, on a more fun note, right? Uh, what inspires you? Oh, gosh. Um, honestly, there are so many uh, young people that I mentor that really inspire me. There's uh, just uh, coming to mind uh, because she's coming over to do some educational outreach with me tomorrow is a young woman, Allison Ayad, uh, who I mentor. And I met her when she was 17. She's oh, she 23 now. She's, gosh, I'm, I've known her for at least five years, and she is so talented, like super smart, so capable, so polite, and she's like a sponge. Everything that I've ever told her, she retains. She runs off and she comes back, and while she was gone, she's improved on whatever the last state that you saw her in. She's so good, and she gives me hope for the future. And, you know, honestly, like all, all the, you know, young people that I, that I mentor and work with, they really inspire me and give me hope for the future. Honestly, like if I get, you know, a DM, as cheesy as it sounds, I'll get a DM from like, you know, a young woman who's studying robotics and, you know, talking to me about how she wants to do mechatronics and this, that and other. And I'm just like, yes. All those little tidbits of seeing other young women like grow and rise up to join um, really inspires me and empowers me and motivates me extra to try to be there to support them and continue on and in, in excelling in what I'm doing and really just reassures me that I'm, I'm on the right path. So definitely the youth of our future engineers totally inspires me. <laughs> nice. What about your proudest achievement? Oh gosh, my proudest achievement. I don't know. I guess ending up here somehow. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, you know, I think it, it was really probably just making the career transition. It was so hard, you know, as you get older and you get, you know, into a habit, you get into a pattern, you get used to a job, you know, you have responsibilities, you incur debt, you know, the older you are, the harder it is to make a change. And yeah, I, I'm extremely proud that I forced myself out of my comfort zone and uh, forced myself to try something that seemed honestly impossible and got through it. <laughs> I, you know, it still kind of shocks me, you know, when uh, Facebook will, you'll open your Facebook app and it'll remind you, you know, 10 years ago today and show you like a photo. And every time it gets me when it pops up, you know, 
a certain number of years ago and I, I look and I think about, you know, what I was doing in my life and where my mind was at and just how much has changed just from getting a STEM education. It's, you know, it's just super profound. Thank you, Facebook, for my, my affirmation of how I've changed my life. You know? <laughs> yeah. What about something you wish you'd invented? Oh, I have the perfect thing. Oh, my gosh. I was just talking about this the other day. Um, it doesn't exist. If somebody invents this, you know, maybe you can take the, the idea from me because I, I haven't patented anything. But please just send me your technology because I want to benefit from it. So some kind of, um, it would have to be a hybrid metal polymer. This is like more of a physics thing. I want a hybrid metal polymer that can uh, uh, demonstrate elastic properties while maintaining uh, electrical conductivity and a certain mechanical strength properties and, and other elements of like that. So that, for example, when, you know, you're coming around a corner and a cord that you're carrying gets stuck on the door handle, it doesn't knock you over. Instead, it just like stretches gently and then is easy to unhook and then resumes back to its normal shape. <laughs> like super, super heady. <laughs> I want this, this non-existent metal polymer. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe NASA will invent it. You know how so many inventions like came, <laughs> came out of the space program. So we never know. What a thunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A fictional character you most identify with. Oh, gosh. Um, so I guess I'd have to say, oh, gosh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Jessica Chastain. Uh, her character in Interstellar is like my doppelganger. She's like grew up on a farm and then becomes a physicist and works for NASA. I'm like, oh yes. And she's a redhead, of course, as like I am. So um, I identify with her. And then also, this is like uh, kind of weird, but Dagny Taggart, she's the heroine in the novel Atlas Shrugged. And the novel has all these political undertones, which I don't necessarily like agree with or relate to, but this woman is like, this total boss. Um, I think she was an engineer and she like ran this railroad, which was just, you know, she just had all these like epic, super hardworking personality traits, which I like love and would like to think that I reflect. <laughs> okay. Would that be the, or I guess Jessica Chastain, would that be your vote to play you in the movie about your life? Oh, yes. Yes. I would be like, yes, all the yes. Okay. How would you like to be remembered? Um, I hope as somebody who helped empower other people and somebody who helped deliver, you know, spacecraft components that helped to increase knowledge for mankind. I just definitely, I think like most people, I want to know that I helped other people and, and made a positive impact on this world. Any recommended reading? Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. Um, I definitely like The Fountainhead, uh, which is another Ayn Rand book. Um, again, the political stuff I don't necessarily associate with, but I like her views on individualism and stuff. Uh, so The Fountainhead would be one. Um, and then also I read recently uh, Educated, which is a memoir, and it was super eye-opening and beautifully uh, written. And I think it was uh, an epic thing to read and think about, about uh, your personal biases and premises and you know, where to find the strength to, to change your life and, and your own personal environment. Super inspiring uh, memoir. Yeah. Any hidden talents? Oh, hidden talents. Um, um, I'm super handy. I don't know if that's hidden. Um, I'm like always outside doing landscaping. I'm currently covered in dirt, uh, almost head to toe right now because I just finished uh, installing new lamps on the front face of my garage and stuff and doing landscaping all day and stuff. Um, I'm a total farm girl, so as, as much as I say I like makeup and fashion and stuff, and you know, those who see me in public will see me in a clean state, uh, I actually have a, a hidden alter ego that my friends call me the feral child because I actually turn into <laughs> a whole farm girl mode outside climbing trees and building stuff. I definitely go back to those roots. It's an alter ego. <laughs> well, I think it's exploratory. If that's the theme that links together your career, you like to explore. Whether that's totally. interests or the outdoors or the bounds of science, right? Yeah, that's true. It's about curiosity. So what's next in terms of your career plans and goals? And uh, how can people find you online and keep track of what you're doing next? 
Yeah, so I just joined this awesome new team uh, and project, which I'm super stoked about. It's uh, basically supporting the Mars sample return mission. So the rover that just landed on Mars uh, this past year uh, is in the process of getting ready to collect all these different rock samples to deposit on the surface of Mars. And then we're collaborating with some foreign partners over a series of subsequent missions which will be a fetch rover that will follow after the um, Perseverance, collect up the sample tubes and package them into this uh, sample pod, which is about the size of the basketball. And then this pod will actually be launched by another robotic spacecraft, which will be a lander. Um, and that's currently being called the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And it's called the Mars Ascent Vehicle because it takes this sample pod and it launches it into Martian orbit right? So it ascends Mars. So now this like basketball sized sample pod will be orbiting around Mars. And then the final step will be uh, what's currently being called the Earth Return Orbiter. And it's an, a satellite which will be sent to orbit Mars. And it basically the orbital trajectories of the sample pod and this satellite will be aligned such that the satellite will capture uh, these sample tubes and contain it, transfer it inside to the satellite and plug it in essentially to uh, an Earth return vehicle, which is a small spacecraft. And the satellite will actually return to Earth and it will eject this small spacecraft with these Martian samples into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it will crash into the Utah desert and scientists will be able to go retrieve these Martian rocks from the middle of the Utah desert so that we can study them extensively with uh, the laboratory resources that we have here on Earth. So wow. that's the Mars Sample Return series of missions. Super cool. It's going to be a really collaborative effort with, again, foreign uh, space agencies and JPL and other NASA centers. And I actually get to deliver, it's called the end effector. And an end effector is like the hand of a robotic arm. And for the orbiter, inside the orbiter, there's going to be a robotic arm. And this hand is what's going to grab the sample pod and stuff it into this Earth return vehicle to uh, prepare it to be ejected uh, into the Earth atmosphere. Um, so I'll get to uh, oversee the design and development of the end effector um, and all that associated hardware and uh, work on all the testing and get it integrated into the arm and then deliver uh, that system over to our partners to be integrated into the higher level satellite. That's so fascinating. It is super fascinating. I'm going to be super busy. I would love to share technical details about my progress, but it's going to be limited information out, of course, until we get past certain milestones. But that being said, I'm always happy to share anything that I can. Anybody who's interested in following me, um, I'm on socials on LinkedIn. Michelle Easter is my full name. And then also I'm on Instagram, me, the Easter. And then I'm also on Twitter at Michelle Easter. I should probably use my Twitter more. Yeah, so you can you can follow me there and anything I can post, I will. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I'm really looking forward to seeing how that unfolds. And I love the visual of the hand, you know, grabbing the samples as well as, I think it's a great metaphor for what you've done with your life. You know, you grabbed the reins, took control of your destiny, like <laughs> grabbed opportunities within reach. So that's a fitting image, I think, to close this out. I am so inspired by this talk. I've mentioned it multiple times, but I think that this is a great message to anyone who is wondering, especially during this pandemic, like, is it too late to do what I always wanted to do? And the answer is, I think it's definitely not. So thank you for giving us that bit of hope. And also for all the work that you do, you know, the life-saving technologies, as well as the science and technological breakthroughs that you're working on. Uh, or advancing mankind. So hats off to you. And thank you so much for all that you do and giving back to your community as well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, and share with a friend so that others can find the pod as well. Do check out at occupationalhazards.podcast on Instagram where we have more updates from our guests and some listener feedback. Slide into our DMs. We'd love to hear from you. Catch you next episode.